Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you an exciting dramatization of an unforgettable story on the Hallmark Playhouse. Tonight's story was chosen from the world of fiction by one of the world's best-known authors. Hallmark is proud to present the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a story that warmed my heart when I first read it. It's called To Mary With Love by Richard Sherman. This is one of those stories that people probably remember best because they recall their own emotions in reading it. And although it's by no means an old story, when most people first read To Mary With Love, their lives were different. And for that matter, the world was different. For it's a story dealing with American life in the years between the two wars. And what a time ago that now seems. Do you remember the Wall Street boom in the 20s, and then the crash, and then the depression and unemployment? Mr. Sherman's three characters in this story do, for it was the background of their own love story. Yes, I said love story. One love story affecting three people. The triangle, you see, and yet a triangle with a difference. Anyhow, good love stories of whatever shape never grow old. So here we are, in the right mood, I hope, to enjoy Richard Sherman's To Marry With Love. But before we begin, here is Frank Goss, who has a message from the people who bring you these stories. There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar, for birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy, there is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say the way you want to say it. And that identifying name on the back, Hallmark. Well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. And now, to Mary with Love on the Hallmark Playhouse. A lawyer's office in New York. It's growing dark, and outside... Broadway is flashing her neon jewels to dazzle the out-of-town customers. Bill Hallam is sitting at his desk, writing. My dear Mary, I'm writing to you from my office. It's less than an hour since you left, and I've been sitting here thinking about you and Jacques and some days that we lived a long time ago. Do you remember when Moonlight and Roses was the big song of the day? You and Jacques were crazy about it. There was a total eclipse of the sun in Rhode Island. An earthquake in Santa Barbara and a real estate boom in Florida. Shingled hair was a novelty. And Jimmy Walker had just been elected mayor of New York City. That all seems a long time ago, doesn't it? At twilight, you were standing in a rice-littered, flower-strewn room at the Copley Plaza, wearing an orchid corsage on a dark blue velvet dress whose hem was 16 inches above the floor and whose waistline slopped around your hips. You turned away from your brand-new husband and looked up at me. You were laughing. <laughs> Wasn't it keen, Bill? Wasn't it the keenest wedding you've ever been to, honey? Yes, it was. Oh, I'm so happy I could die. Tell me that it'll never be more wonderful than it is this minute, because if it is, I simply couldn't bear it. Angel, child, we've got to catch a boat. Well, try not to get seasick. Hey, you dumb bunny. Aren't you even going to take advantage of your chance to kiss the bride? Help yourself, old man. It's the only day it's legal, you know. <laughs> kissed you goodbye. Later, after you'd gone, I wandered into the next room where people were dancing and celebrating your wedding. I don't know what the orchestra was playing or what anybody was saying to anybody else. I only remember a song, distorted and full of pain, going round and round my head like a requiem. Somebody stole my gal. You came back from your honeymoon and moved into that little apartment on East 38th Street. You know, the one with atmosphere instead of air? 
You said I was your first dinner guest, and I must have been because the meal was certainly terrible. Well, I had a big lunch, and I never eat much in this kind of weather. You didn't eat your dinner either, John. Well, I, I don't know what it is, Mary, but my stomach hasn't been very steady the last few weeks. You mean since you've been eating my cooking? Oh, now, wait a minute, honey. It could be lots of other things. Uh, you haven't eaten anything yourself? Well, I cooked it, so I don't have to eat it. Oh, I don't know what happened. Everything came right out of the bride's first cookbook. All it takes is experience, Mary. You'll be better. Sure. You have to get better. Couldn't possibly get worse. I don't know whether that's the most comforting thing you could say right now. Never mind, Mary. We're going to give you an A for effort. Bill, I've been thinking. I'm going to make a million dollars. Well, you'll outgrow that. No, I'm not kidding. I'll do it in the market within, oh, uh, five years, maybe sooner. I know a guy downtown who's made 20000 in the last four months. I've got a neat little nest egg now, and even if I didn't have, there's an arrangement known as margining. Uh, it's a gamble, and I don't like it. Bill C. Hallam. The C is for cautious. Or can he? Well, you do it your way. We'll do it ours. Oh, Bill, it's so good to see you again. We want you to come all the time. Bring your current fashions, whoever they are. We'll arrange so you can have the parlor on alternate Fridays. You come often, Bill. Early and often. I did come, not as frequently as I wanted to, but probably more frequently than I should. I brought a series of girls. I brought beautiful ones and bright ones and red-headed ones and a couple who were on diets. And each of them would seem fine to me until they stood in the same room with you. And then I'd realize that whatever they were, they weren't what I wanted. And then one evening, I brought Kitty Brandt. Beautiful girl, Kitty. Beautiful and smart. Good night, Bill. It was a swell evening. I'm crazy about Doc and Mary. So am I. <laughs> How long have you been in love with her? In love with her? You're, you're, you're a little off center, aren't you? Am I? Well, she's married, remember? Yes. I remember. Well, it's an old story and maybe not a very interesting one, but it so happens by a peculiar coincidence that he's my best friend and so is Mary. We just hang around together. Well, that's simply dandy, isn't it? Damon and Pythias and the girlfriend. <laughs> Is it your impression that the best things in life are three? No. That's good. Because it isn't mine, either. That was in May. The Roxy had just been opened and the Ile de France just launched. There was trouble in Nicaragua. Helen Morgan was sitting on a piano, and Coolidge did not choose to run. And the whole city was going crazy over Lindbergh's flight to Paris. That was in May. And in August, on a sultry, stifling afternoon, I went up to your apartment after work to meet Jock for a midsummer bachelor's dinner. And you were supposed to be at Bar Harbor lying on a beach, but there you were in that hot apartment with your face as white as the sheets that covered the furniture. Bill, have you seen Kitty Brandt lately? Well, no, she's been sort of tied up. So I gather. I, I found this package on his dressing table. Well, it's obviously a jeweler's box, isn't it? Yes, but... And look at the card. It says, to Kitty, doesn't it? Oh, now, wait a minute. That, that's something I asked Jock to pick up. You, you see, it's Kitty's birthday, and I, I don't know very much about what girls like. And What's the matter? What, what, why are you looking at me like that? Are you going to write to buy a girl a present? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm in here. I got tied up at the office. Mary! Oh, Mary, darling, what a surprise. Come here, let me look at you. Don't, John, don't. What's the matter? Found this package on the table. I didn't mean to pry. It just never occurred to me that I shouldn't look at it. There isn't any reason why you shouldn't. Well, I told Mary you bought it for me to give to Kitty. You shouldn't have said that to I knew you was lying. Funny, I thought you'd have the decency to lie, too. Well, if you've reached the point where you don't trust me... Trust you? What would you think if you walked in and found something like that? Oh, well, wait a minute, you two. You've had the kind of marriage that doesn't come along very often. Now, fight, fight to keep it, not to get rid of it. Either one of you will ever find another one like it. Well, I, I'll call you for dinner in a day. Oh, John. John! I'm sorry, Mary. You and Jock went away that autumn to Bermuda, and 
When you came back, you were all freckled and healthy, and Jock had grown a mustache. There was a new radiance to both of you, and right in the middle of a long, complicated story about a fishing trip, you suddenly stopped talking, looked at Jock, and then you said... Shall we tell him, darling? I suppose he's old enough. What do you think? Well, if we don't tell him, he might hear about it at school. At school? Well, what's got into you two? Are you <laughs> not completely? Absolutely and completely. We're going to have a baby, Bill. Did you ever hear of anything like that in your whole life? Imagine Jock and me being a pop and a mom. Especially her. Anyone could tell in one look she's underage, couldn't they? <laughs> oh, isn't it exciting, Bill? You're the very first one to know. Uh, congratulations. Couldn't happen to two nice people. We have everything in the world now. Everything in the world. Yes. You have everything in the world. I walked home through the empty streets, completely alone, devastatingly lonely. But all the way home, it wasn't you I was thinking of. It was Kitty Brandt and an expression she'd used, Damon and Pythias and the girlfriend. And I thought of her question, is it your impression that the best things in life are free? I had said no. But in a couple of weeks, if someone had asked you that question, you and Jock would certainly have a different answer. Being married to you made all the difference in the world to any question. I knew that. But there was nothing I could ever do about it. Before Mr. Hilton introduces the second act, let us go back for a moment to a time many years ago. Our scene is set on the spacious lawns of a white-pillared mansion in Virginia. It is Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson, diplomat, statesman, and of late, the President of the United States. Mr. Jefferson is entertaining some family friends, and a young lady asks him to tell of his happiest moment, fully expecting to hear of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Mr. Jefferson smiles and, without hesitation, in his careful, cultivated tones, answers, I have known many, my dear. The happiest moments my heart has known are those in which it is pouring forth its affection. That truth is known to many of us. Those who make Hallmark cards know it, too. And on that truth, they have built a tradition. The tradition that every Hallmark card, regardless of the occasion, is sincere, warm, and affectionate. Whether it calls for an expression of gaiety or wit, sympathy or gladness. Any occasion for a friend to express his personal sentiments to another. You will find a Hallmark card exactly fitting your needs. A card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. No wonder your friends receive Hallmark cards with an extra measure of satisfaction. For when they turn the card over, as you did, and see the name Hallmark, they know you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Mr. Hilton continues with the second act of the story he's chosen for tonight, Richard Sherman's To Marry With Love. We're midway in Richard Sherman's story to Mary with Love. In his office late that night, attorney Bill Hallam is writing a letter to the girl he didn't marry. Jock phoned me on a hot damp evening and he sounded like he was in China instead of New York. Bill, the, ba- the baby's dead. It was born dead. The baby's dead. How's Mary? The doctor says she'll be all right. The doctor says she'll be all right. Jock. Jock! Shall I get this for you? No, never mind. I sat beside your hospital bed when you were finally able to receive visitors, wanting to help you, but not knowing how. Wishing I could say part of what I felt. I'm going on a cruise to the North Cape as soon as they let me off here. Well, that'll be good for you. Is Jock going too? No. 
No, Jock's working a lot. He seems to have the feeling that money is the only important thing in the world now. In fact, it looks as though we're going to be known as those wealthy Wallaces. Jock's founding a financial dynasty. Except that a dynasty has... Wasn't my fault, was it, Bill? No, of course not. You know, in the movies, it's always a baby that cements the father and mother together for keeps. Well, it's going to be an interesting experiment with Jock and me. Because it seems there isn't going to be any baby ever. Everybody says the movie should be more like life. I think life should be more like the movie. Mary, I wish I knew something to say to you. Oh, don't be sorry, Tom. It'll be nice to be rich. I'll have cars to match dresses and dresses to match moods. We're going to be the gayest people in town, Jock and I. The gayest people in town. <laughs> came back from the cruise with several trunks full of new clothes, a different way of doing her hair, and Irene Potter and her brother, Sloan. The three of you did the town together for weeks before I saw you. When I finally did get to see you alone, you said... Phil, I decided to leave Jock. You... You what? I'm going to marry Sloan Potter. He's already in Mexico waiting for me. I'm waiting for Jock to come home now so I can tell him. You, you're going to... My mind's completely made up and nothing anyone says is going to stop me. Do you think you'll be happy with Sloan? Who knows? I'm not happy now. Jock and I have been living in a vacuum for months. But he hasn't been home for three days. He hasn't even telephoned. Mary, you know that Sloan Potter's a playboy and a... a you can't tell me anything about Sloan, Bill. I know him much better than you do. Oh, well, there's Jock. There's a man who appreciates the value of a last-minute entrance. Well, I bored you with my little story. Now, I might as well bore him. Is that you, Jock? Is that the captain of industry? Mary can get me some, some coffee or something. I haven't had anything to eat for three days. Oh, yes, of course, John. Here, here, sit down. What's the matter? Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a quick fall. Then he was all broke, busted, smashed. It was Thursday, October 24th, 1929. The end of an era. The end of a lot of things. Instead of going to Mexico, you went to a rented house in Flushing with Jock. You and Irene Potter opened a candy shop. Jock's cuffs were frayed and his eyes puffy, and I... I wondered what the two of you said and did and felt when you were alone. Life, or a form of it, went on. Newt Rockney crashed, Gandhi was arrested for making salt, Edison died, and Theodore Dreiser slapped Sinclair Lewis. Everybody was playing Tom Thumb Golf, and somebody wrote a song called Happy Days Are Here Again. But they weren't. On Christmas Eve, we were supposed to have a party, but when I arrived, Jock wasn't home yet. We sat there looking at each other across the small tree in the artificial fireplace with the gas log. Christmas, Bill. Merry Christmas, darling. Merry Christmas. It's a sentimental nice, isn't it? Why? What are you thinking about? Well, I was... I was thinking about you. I was remembering how I used to dream of being alone with you on Christmas, and now I am. And it's not at all the way I dreamed it would be. What do you mean, Bill? Mary... What would you say if I told you that I was in love with you? Well, I'd say that, that that's the type of thing you sometimes say when you're sitting with an old friend on a night like this and are very embarrassed about the next day. But I am in love with you. I have been from the time you threw your first mud pie at me. Oh, Bill, don't please, please don't spoil me. You and Jock and I have been friends such a long time. Jock! There's been an accident. An accident? I was driving down Northern Boulevard, and I run over a guy that lives at this address. I took him to the hospital, and I thought maybe you'd want to go. <laughs> He's alive, if that's what you mean. Broke a couple of ribs. I'll drive you over in my car. I'll get a coat. It wasn't my fault. Why didn't he watch where he was going? I blew my horn, didn't I? 
A fine Christmas this is. A fine Christmas. It was a long time before Jock was on his feet again. Lots of things happened in the interim. There was a century of progress, a new deal, bank holidays, Anthony Adverse, and a midget sat on Morgan's lap. After that Christmas Eve, I thought it would be better if I wasn't near you, so I arranged things to take me out of town. Business in Chicago, business in California, business any place. Except where you were. I took girls out, made love to them, and tried to convince both them and myself that I was serious, but I was still too faithful to you in my fashion. You were the works with me, and I realized you always would be. The night I finally returned to New York was repeal night, and I accidentally ran into you on the streets. Bill, you big well, lug. How are you? Hey, why didn't you let us know you were in town? Oh, you look wonderful, Bill. We've missed you. I've missed you, too, both of you. Let's get in some place where we can sit down and talk. Well, I can't right now. I'm late for an appointment. Why don't I call you next week? Oh, please do that, Bill. It's still the same number. How are things with you? Why, things are wonderful. I've got a job with a wool importer, and I'm getting a promotion next month. I'm uh, doing it the slow way this time, Bill, but I'm getting there. He's going to take over the entire New York office in another few months. You wait and see. Good, I'm glad to hear it. Be sure and call it, Bill. Anyone could see that you were headed upward. You were safe and secure once more. And I was there watching you, as always, on the outside, looking in. And it was almost the way it had been ten years before, except for Jock's eyes and that tiny white zigzag in your hair. And then, this afternoon, you came into my office and sat by my desk. You smiled rather sadly, I thought, and said... This isn't a social call, Bill. It's business. You were in on the beginning, and I thought you might as well be in on the end. I've left, Jock. I want to get a divorce, and I want you to get it for me. Is there another man, Mary? No, and there won't be. From now on, I'm the cat that walks by itself. You've thought it over carefully. Yes, very carefully. I've already moved to the plus. Mary, why are you leaving him now? Well, Bill, I stayed with him when I could be of help to him. But now he has his business and I have mine. We, we don't need each other anymore, that's all. With nothing in common. I see. Make me out a bill of complaint or brief or whatever it's called, Bill. Say it's incompatibility. Say it's mutual fatigue. Say it's... Just say it's ten years. I sat down to draw up your brief, staring at a blank sheet of paper. And then suddenly a door opened and I heard a voice. Hello, Bill. Hello, Jock. Come in. Sit down. Bill, she's left me. I don't even have her address. She, she wants a divorce. Yes, I know. She was here. Bill, where is she? She can't leave me now. She can't. Yes, she can, and she's going to. Now, take it easy, John. Bill, don't, don't. You don't know what she can mean to a man. She's... Oh, Bill, please help me. She might listen to you because she knows you're disinterested. Tell her that I won't interfere with her business plans. Tell her that the future isn't going to be like the past. Tell her... Tell her she's all I have, all I want. She's engaged me as her counsel, Jock. I see. Oh, I see. Well, I, I just hoped you could do something. We have so much in common, Mary, and I. It doesn't seem. What? It just doesn't seem. I sat alone in my office, listening to things you'd said, and perhaps forgotten. I thought of times passing and the way the years shuttle into each other like the sections of a collapsible drinking cup. We have nothing in common, you said, but you didn't say once that you no longer loved him. And so I started to write, and this is what I've written. Here's your brief, Mary. 
A brief made up of things that you and Jock have done, words you've spoken, and rooms you've lived in. Here are the years that you and Jock have lived together. And I think if you look them over carefully, this is the only brief you'll want. In any case, it's the only brief that I can draw for you. Affectionately, Bill. Hello, Jock. This is Bill, Johnny. I've written something that I'd like you to give to Mary. Would you pick it up and take it over? I'll leave it in the door. The address will be on it. And, Jock, when you give the envelope to her, tell her I sent it and you as a 10th anniversary present to Mary with love. moment, James Hilton will return to tell you about next week's story. Meantime, I'd like to remind you that there's nothing like one of those colorful Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe to make a child's eyes light up with joy. There are 16 dolls in all, Little Miss Muffet, Cinderella, Little Boy Blue, and 13 other childhood favorites. Each one wears a hat topped off by a jaunty plume that's a real feather. Each doll stands up by itself, and each one has a clever rhymed story about the doll inside. Children really love them. Grown-ups do, too, because Hallmark dolls are the perfect answer on many an occasion. A children's party, for instance. You couldn't ask for nicer favors or more appropriate place cards than these unique Hallmark dolls. Or as rewards for good behavior. Children will be as good as good can be when they know that the reward for faithfully following your instructions will be a new and different Hallmark doll to add to their collection. And remember, these colorful, feather-hatted, hallmark dolls are just as grand for children who live far away from you as for those in your own home. Hallmark dolls, you see, are just as easy to send as any hallmark greeting card. And they cost only 25 cents each. See all 16 of the charming and colorful hallmark dolls tomorrow at the store where you buy your hallmark greeting cards. And now here is James Hilton to tell you about our plans for the hallmark playhouse in the weeks to come. Next week, we shall present one of the best love stories of our time, Cimarron, by Edna Ferber, and it will be a particular pleasure for us to welcome as our guest on this occasion, Miss Irene Dunn. And the following week, we shall have as our guest my good friend, Ronald Coleman. And our story will be Mr. Hilton's own lovable and unforgettable Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Thank you, Frank. And you know, I must confess, I'm looking forward to it. But then, too, I'm looking forward to the week after that when we shall have Miss Luanna Patton and Lionel Barrymore in Captain January. So plan to be listening these Thursday nights. And now I'm sure you will want to know who our actors were in To Mary With Love. Those grand performers were Arnold Moss in the role of Bill Hallam, Lorene Tuttle, William Johnstone, B. Benaderet, and Wally Mayer. And so until next Thursday on the Hallmark Playhouse, this is James Hilton saying good night. Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Gene Holloway. Our music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Cimarron. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. (laughs) 